Hello everybody, my name is Amol Patel, you're watching the Smoking Hot Coffee Show, where every day, Monday through Friday, 1pm Pacific Standard Time, uh, we talk to startup founders. I'm joined with... Hey guys, I'm Jeff Pelting down here in San Diego. And today we've got Chris Keller from followup.cc. We had this amazing interview with this startup founder from Boston, he's been around the block many times. This, this interview lasted almost two hours and he talked about his, his background and, and all the different startups and all the different things that he's done in the last uh, several years. And Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, wow, what a, what a great interview, Jeff. Oh, wow. It, yeah, really good. A uh, lot of information we learned. Uh, crazy story of, I uh, didn't know uh, that we were going to get the, that um, much of a story, but uh, he's just like you know you or I or the audience out there who was sitting there working at a, uh, in a technical job or you know, at a startup and wanted to start his own thing and hacking away at projects on the weekends and in his spare time and uh, you know, was making it happen. Yeah, it, it, he talked about his early ideas of uh, sending messages from cell phones, and then he started getting into uh, a social network for tennis players, and then he built an app, and then he well, at one point was trying to get recruited for at Facebook, and we talked about so many things. I, 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 I don't even know how to recap this in this intro, Jeff. Yeah, I don't think I can do it justice either. I think uh, any of our interviews that go this long are uh, con considered epic at the least. Uh, you guys got to listen to the end. There's a, a lot of great nuggets in there mm -hmm. uh, and little lessons. Absolutely. So if you're remotely interested in the Boston startup scene, if you're thinking about creating a product of your own, if you want to talk, learn what it was like to, to have a funded startup and to have a co-founder and then uh, have that fail and then do this other thing, I mean, this guy has been through the block and he knows from the trenches what it's like. And uh, it was really awesome to hear all that. Yep, and the product followup.cc is really great. Uh, it's a you know the inbox is a hot space right now. Everyone's got trouble trying to empty their inbox and you know spend as little time as possible fuddling around with it. And there's some missing features from most email clients that he's built with followup.cc that works very simply by just sending a BCC to a special email address. So that way you can use it with any email client. Right. And it's just super helpful. And we love to hear the story uh, that you know it wasn't an overnight success. It wasn't like a, a little aha thing. He he's been building this for years and got his friends using it and finally started charging people. And it continues to evolve. Yeah, and so now he's actually, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's paying his bills. He doesn't need to really get another job. He's an in angel investor, in fact, in a couple of other startups, and we talked briefly about that. Uh, you know, it, I, I want to talk. There's so much more stuff that we learned in this interview, but it's just so hard for you to recap it because it was, it, it was, it was really great. It's, if you're remotely interested in the tech sector, if you're thinking about what's this whole startup's all about, you're going to learn so much. It's going gonna, it's gonna to really... Uh, it's going to be a great two hours. I tr trust me on that one. Um, and so with with that, uh, everybody, please check out his his product, followup.cc, and uh, you know join us uh, every day, Monday through Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, on Google Hangouts, where we talk to founders. Uh, where you can subscribe to us via iTunes and, of course, via Stitcher and of YouTube. Jeff. Yep, everyone come to our website, smokinghotcoffee.com, uh, and hit the subscribe button. You can find all of the channels that we're on. You can also email us directly at info at smokinghotcoffee.com. Please let us know if there's someone you want us to have on the show or some topic that uh, we ought to cover. We want to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Please email us. We love getting those. So uh, with that, let's go to the interview. All right, Chris, thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, how you doing today, man? I'm good. I'm good. It's, it's really, really hot in Boston, and not just hot, but humid, unlike the cool California heat. This is like the hot, muggy East Coast heat. You know, we're getting the same thing here in LA. I don't know about you, Jeff. Yeah, we got a little bit of the muggy uh, wave coming through for sure. Oh, all right. So it's it's national. It's not just yeah. here. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's hitting all of us. Week. Yeah. <laughs> we, it's are all, weather. we are all one muggy people. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so tell us, Chris, uh, you know, uh, we ran into your site and you're trying to build this thing on Gmail. It's looks really cool. Tell us more about your product. Uh, sure. So first of all, I'm going to correct you. It's not, it's certainly not for Gmail only. So follow up oh. is kind of the, it's like that missing feature from all email systems, which is the uh, ability to embed a reminder in an email. Uh, and then of course also, um, you know, snooze emails for later. Um, and this has kind of become, I guess, a hotter topic recently with some, you know, things that have come out and been developed. But Overall, follow-up is just kind of like the really the only like universal solution that works in everyone's email, works on mobile, 
It's still the only way to set a reminder on an outgoing email you send on an iPhone. Um, so, you know, it's just a really useful service wow, in that. that so so that, this is a problem that people have had for a really long time, right? In their email yeah. inboxes, we're used to using clients like Outlook, uh, Gmail, or some other webmail. Uh, they're all pretty standard, right? You get the inbox metaphor and the um, not a whole lot of tools around it, especially connecting to the calendar. Yeah, I mean, our, our, in terms of thought, I agree with you on the calendar thing. I think there could definitely be more integrations there with the tools that are out there. But um, And like follow-up specifically just does kind of a we let you see your reminders on the calendar, like essentially putting emails on your calendar. Um, but aside from that, yeah, there could be so much more interesting stuff done with calendars. Yeah, well, this is one of those key features that's been missing forever and ever and ever. And I don't know why it took you to make this thing. <laughs> why didn't everybody have this? I mean, does this sound crazy to you, or is it just me? It, no, it does a little. I, I think there's a. I think a lot of it is just um, like the solution, like follow up as a solution. It's it's really easy to use, but at the same time, it's kind of a clever hack. And some people will just never like the idea of like thinking about what to type as an email address to say when you want to be reminded. Um, and so obviously like you can make a plugin with a GUI and whatever and like people have done that. But, um, but I mean like I, I created this in 2007, the first version. And I was running another startup that was venture backed so I couldn't like spend my time working on this. Um, so it, I basically just built it and used it myself. Right. But I always built it as a service, knowing that eventually, you know, people would use it, or I'd have more time. Um, so anyway, so yeah, that was kind of the funny thing. It's been around for so, I guess, six years now, and only like in the past like three years have I put, you know, more of the time in to make it like a real full-time service, and you know, make it grow and have a revenue model and all this stuff. So. Awesome. Tell, well, yeah, tell, real quick, before we get into the revenue model, and we'll, uh, okay. I want you to tell our audience real quick how the product works if they're not looking at your homepage yeah, right now. Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, like Amul was guessing it worked with Gmail, which is most of uh, our, you know, a, fa a favorite uh, email client. But I think it's genius that you're able to, you yeah. know, like you called it a hack, but it works with any email client. Is that right? Yeah. Tell us real quick yeah. how that functions. So, so it's really, uh, it came from this, um, I just wanted to say, I just asked the question, how can I put a reminder on an email I send to someone? And the easiest way was like, well, what if I BCC when I want to be reminded? Okay. And so then you just have to represent when. So the service works that simply. In the BCC field, I can type like five days at followup.cc. It's an email address. And oh, so that's in five awesome. Days, and in five days, I'm going to get a reminder. That is brilliant. And I so, of that. course, yeah, and of course, it's like, oh, well, what about if I said Friday? Yeah, Friday works. What if I said July 30th? Yeah, July 30th right. works. Right. Uh, what if I said, like, 9 p.m.? Yeah, 9 p.m. works. What about tonight? Yeah, tonight works. So, you know, you Elegant. get the picture. Yeah. yeah. It's so a great really simple, and yeah. it's going to work with all the clients. And, yeah. yeah. It's kind of intuitive. Yeah, it's brilliant, man. And I'm just saying... Uh, Seven years ago, you busted this thing out. Are you making money with this? Is, I, I, can you quit your job? Is this it? Uh, no, I, I run this full time. Yeah, it's it's a profitable business. That's um, awesome. Congrats it, to you, uh, my friend. I raise my cup to you, making it profitable, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Smoking Every hot minute, cup to you, man. You know, it's it's never. You know, you know how you read on like TechCrunch and other sites about all these like flashy, high growth startups and right. You know, yeah. even, if people even talk about the like uh, what's his name Paul at Y Combinator. Talk, Paul Graham talks about how like the definition of a startup is just growth. There's like nothing else that matters. And you know, and I don't actually disagree with him. You could just argue that I have a great small business that happens to be an internet company. But basically, you know, basically started charging for it uh, in January 2011, and revenue has grown every month since then. Wow, that's awesome. So you waited a while, man. Like, what happened? Like, what did you wake up one morning and, th and thought, I'm done with this job. This is no. it. No, no, it was, it was just kind of career path stuff. It was like, I was running this VC backed company from 2007 to 2009 called Fafarazzi, okay. um, which was also like a really fun site. Um, and then, and then basically I left that and I joined HubSpot as their, um, like the product manager for uh, HubSpot Labs, which was okay. with Mesh the founder. 
Right. And so, but after a year of that, it was like labs is kind of not really labs anymore. And so I said, I'm going to go run follow up full time because the inbox is hot. The service is getting popular. Right, right. Okay. So you were at HubSpot. So you saw what was going on back in the. You know, behind the scenes, they're doing so well, and you thought. Yeah, just, you know, I, I was employee number eighty when I was there. So, and now they're like five fifty or six hundred. Yeah, they're wow. doing great. Um, so you thought, well, wow, this is the, this is a great area. I should make money with this. Is that what happened? Yeah. Or, yeah, you know, it, it was honestly because like I had all all my friends were using it, okay. and they kept saying like, "Dude, this is my favorite tool. Like, wow. why aren't you charging okay. me for it?" Okay. <laughs> um, and it was kind of that simple. It was like everyone telling me, like, go charge for this because I want to pay you for it. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So, I mean, like, like how many, did you just have a handful of friends basically using it, or were they starting to tell their friends? Was there a little bit of no, word of it, mouth, or, or it, was it just it, a oh, steady a great question. Yeah. Yeah, no, there was a lot of word of mouth, and even to this day, I feel like the primary mover is still word of mouth. Um, on top of just, like, you know, doing a press thing here or there, um, you know, like just getting an article written. Because now everyone's writing articles about, like, tools to manage your inbox. And, like, right. thankfully, I get mentioned in a lot of these. And so that's always kind of driving Oh, that's great. Um, but I would say word of mouth and, and just kind of uh, people liking the product has just been the number one thing. And I and it, you know it's funny because no one for like people listening to this you kind of hate hearing that because it's just like oh well you because I say this too I'm like if you just had a great idea and executed well like right. you're gonna get a lot yeah. of business just from that. Right. Um, but then but then like just to, to build like a really sustainable business you still have to like figure out you know, how to acquire customers on a regular basis, how to put more money into marketing and then get more money out. Right. And like, I don't even say, we haven't even figured that out. Like, there's still lots to figure out there. Well, I have to tell you, Chris, I'm sort of green with envy right now. I mean, I'm wearing a green shirt <laughs> and uh, I'm feeling so like, how did this guy pull this off? Like, this is the most simplest, easiest hack. Like, not, well, not easy, but it's like the easiest idea. And, and, and like this one function and it does so great, and you're able to live off of it. And then, I mean, Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong, but th this is like the the most common probably issue people have with emails. If, do they open it, and will they get a reminder? And yeah, absolutely. I know, I, I, I've had this problem a lot. You know, I, I'm glad that you scratched that itch and are are you know uh, letting everyone use this because we all want it so bad. Uh, it's surprising Gmail doesn't have it. Yeah, it's super uh, surprising. Or, it's surprising that all mail clients don't have this. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, I, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I feel like that trend will change soon, especially with mobile, because people are getting more focused now on building out new UIs yeah. um, for specific functionality. So, like with the Mailbox app coming out uh, mm -hmm. recently on like iOS and stuff. You know, they did a really good job of making it really elegant to snooze something. And obviously, they're just basically follow-up in an app. And so I feel yeah. stupid for not having built it. Um, but they well, also want to be an entire mail client and kind of a system. Right. Um, and so, for example, they, I don't even know why they haven't even built a way to set a reminder in an outgoing email yet. And I don't know if it's, again, yeah. like a user interface yeah. thing. Right. Um, because, you know, like you can use follow-up with Mailbox. If you're composing an email in Mailbox, then use yeah, follow-up. That's, that's so great. No, it's brilliant. I just, yeah, yeah. I'm just telling you, it's, it's awesome that you figured it out, man. It's great. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear your philosophy on on the Mailbox client, or just mail clients in general, uh, as we continue to go in this huge app ecosystem where the mail client hasn't changed at all, really. Yeah. You know, we hardly even see native mail apps because we or like after we left kind of web 2.0 where we're like get everything onto the web uh, I think it's great that you guys work with every client like I mean don't you think people are weary of using the mailbox like a new native app where they're gonna rip the rug out from under you or change it or you know you kinda lose some of the features where you know I could take yeah. follow up with me anywhere like you said yeah so it's kind of interesting because so two years ago I remember the, this company asked me to like merge with them or join them and they wanted to build a mail client, and I said, you're crazy. Like, you just need to build a plug-in to Gmail or whatever, because they wanted to be Gmail only uh, to start. And I was like, no one in their right mind wants to build a mail client. Do you know how hard that yeah. is? And yeah. Well, no, and I was like, it, think about it. You're trying to be better than Gmail. You think you're going to beat Gmail on an yeah. interface game, right? Right. Um, but then the interesting thing is that all of a sudden now, because Gmail is so open, 
and that you everyone can access that the mail they're still doing the really heavy lifting <laughs> of like maintaining mail servers and this and that mm -hmm. and so now people finally said like well I want a better like kind of interaction on mobile so everyone's kind of starting with mobile and they're building out these better interfaces that are like whether it's more streamlined or whatever and I think again this is why I say that you only get a subset of the features really like like even the Gmail, the native Gmail app, I think is great, and I think it works well. Um, and they have swipe stuff too that I'm not sure a lot of people realize, but they just don't have the snoozing thing yet. Um, but I think this, like, uh, I, I think the main notion is that people are now willing to use an app for a specific behavior, um, which is what I see tr Mailbox is now supplying. Is like they are the email triage app. But then people still want to be in the Gmail app to do most of their email. Um, so, I, but then the question becomes like, do people get annoyed at the fragmentation of their behavior over time across these apps where they're like, oh, I just composed an email, but I just got like 10 more emails. So now I'm going to go into mailbox to answer or like, you know, snooze them. It's like, it's kind of odd. Like, I don't know how that quite will evolve. That, that's I, a big, that's a big problem. You just, t yeah. that's a huge problem. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I was just gonna say that I, I feel like everyone always wants the one end all be all app, so long it stays easy to use. As soon as it gets complicated, then people start bitching and say, yeah. "I Absolutely. want a better app," or "I want to do this better." And yeah. then, like, right. someone comes along and builds a better feature, mm -hmm. and then everyone <laughs> uses that for a while, and then and then they say to that app maker, "Oh, well, can't you do this as well? And can't you right. do this as well?" Right. And like before you know it, it always happens where then like that app turns into just another bloated mail client. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so what are you, you doing know. with your roadmap to, to manage that? Because like you have a beautiful, simple feature, and I think that's the magic of it. Uh, are your yeah. users asking for more features? They want this and that. Or are people screaming for, hey, give me a native app or, you know, just to wrap the feature yeah, no, you know, it's an interesting question. Like, I honestly am, I'm a little, I, I'm thinking a lot about the roadmap myself and kind of like watching where this stuff goes because the yeah. mailbox thing was certainly the biggest, like, interesting slash oh shit, you know, to like what I do. Right. And on the flip side, I think a lot of people are kind of forgetting that while the UI is um, like a mailbox thing is really important, I also think that a lot of people forget how much value is behind the scenes in email. Um, and so follow-up, for example, works without having to provide access to your inbox, right? You can just like literally right now just yeah. start using follow-up. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. I, this whole B BCC thing is a genius. That's such a, just let me mention that how big of a feature that is actually, you know, when you say how easy it is for these other startups to tap into your Gmail, uh, like that gives me a little bit of the creepers, you know, to just start uh, opening up my you know, Gmail, actually, my Jeff email brings wholesale up, to people. Yeah, yeah, so Jeff and I have talked about this actually in numerous episodes where, uh, you know, they can just go right in and grab all this information. And What do you think about this whole security issue? I know it's kind of a a little bit of tangent there. Um, so I, I, I don't actually, you know, it's interesting. I, I think there was a Wired article about why you should care. And it was basically saying, like, one day you might actually care that they can monitor or see everything you write, and that's when it's going to be freaky to you. Because, like, I definitely kind of took the stance of, like, uh, you know, I'm not that worried about it if the you know the government can see into our emails because I, I don't know I'm not saying anything that I'm worried about. Right. Um, they make the point though that one day if you actually have something that's not technically illegal but like iffy, like then you would be really worried about it. Right. Um, but here's the thing. But in terms of like just focusing on like the fact that anyone can access your inbox in a second and get literally all of your mail and the body data and everything. Right. I have not understood why Gmail has not said we are going to default to like the default access is header information only okay. and then you need some kind of elevated permissions to see the body of the email as well. I don't know why they haven't done that because that makes perfect sense to me. Okay. Um, but they just, you know, if you just ask, ask for access to Gmail, you get it all. So I get like everything in your inbox from like Eight years ago, since we all jumped on Gmail, wow. they can get that much data. 
Wow. Is this all through the what, developer what, API? What's that? Is this through the developer API? Because I know a lot of these tools are also seemingly like inject themselves just right on the page. Oh, yeah. So the ones that in inject themselves on the page actually can't see anything. But the oh, difference okay. is that uh -huh. for them to do anything, they generally need access to your inbox. Because the main problem is that, like on Gmail, you uh, if you are a Gmail only plugin, you need to look at the URL of the email to know what email they're talking about, and then you have to go back into your server and then go back into the person's inbox with that information and say, "Give me the body of this email." Okay. So Gmail, Gmail actually hides all of that. Oh, that's great. So as a developer, like on the client side. Uh, those scripts are actually just for the interface, really, and they're calling back to the server to do the API calls with your access through their their uh, app. Uh, yeah, which is also why they can be slow, and this is another actually benefit to follow up. I get a lot of people who say, "I want follow up. I like follow up .cc better because it doesn't ever slow down my yeah, inbox. It's fast. Yeah, you know, yeah. it natively works. And and then yeah. the other thing is. Um, the addresses, like the more you use follow up, they they add, they build up in your contacts over time. Oh, so, sure. Uh, so basically, you start literally typing one W, and you, mm. it auto completes to one week of follow up .cc, and you're done. Like it's just so fast. It's like you don't even have to think about I, it. You know, I'm really curious to to follow up on my MV issue. Uh, how long did it take you to make this thing? Did, did you spend like a, a two or three weeks on it? Was it a several month effort? No. Here's the thing. I mean, the this is true of like every kind of I think idea people build. I would say like the very, very, very first proof of concept of like a working service was, uh, I don't know, a week, and then, and this is in 2007. But right. then literally the amount of stuff you have to do to make it like elegant and secure and robust and right. like manageable as you grow, it's like God, the amount of code that evolved over time and the amount yeah. of ed the amount of edge cases in email is probably the biggest pain. Yeah. Hard because like you think that yeah. like there's all these standards and there are. Right. The problem is a lot of people don't apply or you know, they don't listen to these standards or they right. don't they do, do their own thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so, I, so, so I go like hunting into email headers, and I'm like looking at like, you know, I'm trying to decipher how all this stuff works. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, good lord, I see what they did. They're an idiot. And like, and then I have to build in some edge case into the code because it's that's, actually worth handling that case. That's great. That's great. So, uh, so give us your background because we we kind of jumped over all that. Uh, yeah. You know. Well, uh, hopefully now people are interested enough to know who I am. <laughs> I am. So let's let's go let's, let's do this. Uh, what, what did you where did you go to school? What what did you do? Uh, so I I uh, I grew up in Northern Virginia, just outside D.C., and went to Virginia Tech and did computer science and economics. Um, was always was always a good programmer, even though was I didn't kind of fit the mold of like the C.S. student. Um, but anyways, came out of school. Wait, wait, for wait, wait. Don't don't gloss over that because Jeff, I want you to hear this. Jeff, let, let's hear this mold. Well, yeah, I was just. I think we talked about this on the last episode. But yeah, just did. as a startup entrepreneur, I didn't find computer science to be very, um, you know, supportive of uh, kind of explaining what was out there. I mean, I guess I started college in like 2003 or so, and you know, it was basically like enterprise Java. End of story. Uh, and so I quickly was like, when I dropped out of school, I saw, oh wow, there's startups and people like using, you know, the web for consumer stuff too. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, that was my experience in, in college. Yeah, I never did. I mean, literally in college, the only thing I ever did was C plus plus, and then I just taught myself like web programming in general. I mean, I literally built my first database backed website with like ASP back in like you know sophomore junior year of college. Um, and then finally went to like PHP in like 2003 or four or something, and you know because at the time that was the thing. Um, but but I was at Johnson and Johnson actually uh, for this like rotational leadership program. Did that for two years. Stayed on. Stayed with them for another year and a half. But I was so bored at the company because it's it's a great company, but it's like where you go to retire. It's where old people go. And uh, oh, wow. <laughs> Is that really true? I mean, is, does it feel like that to you? Yeah. I mean, it was like I, I had nothing to do, and I was in, like, this cushy, like, corporate headquarters job. I mean, it was just like it was 
I mean, granted, I feel like there was other people doing stuff, but it was just because they were like managers or directors and they just had a crap ton of work. But like, right. I don't know how I got away with it, but I'm not complaining really. Right. Um, but uh, so anyway, so on the side though, uh, so the first thing, I, the first web app I ever built was actually the ability for people to check their email via SMS when we all had flip phones. Wow. Oh, okay. okay. And like, it was because I saw these people with Blackberries, and I was like, why do they get to check their email and I don't when yeah. I'm out in the city? Yeah, that's uh, a smart idea. Yeah. So I built that. It was like this really elegant interface. Um, like, worked. It worked decently well, but it was kind of like you know, smartphones basically killed that very quickly. Right. Um, and then, uh, and so then after that, I built the like Facebook of the tennis industry. Um, which did pretty well and got a lot of press and like I got to meet all my idols and stuff in the tennis world. But oh, that's great. Uh, but uh, wait, so, wait, before you get into that, uh, Jeff, can you bring that site up? Let, let's put it up on the screen. I saw this and I was wondering when I first saw it. My first thought was like, oh, this is a cool idea, social network for tennis players. What was it called again? Mesh. Yeah, mesh tennis. Mesh tennis. Yeah. yeah. Is, is how did you come up with this idea? How did what happened to it? Like, is it still going yeah. or? Yeah, I mean, it still works. I haven't, I haven't done anything with it in a long time, but it's still technically there. I mean, it's so, like, web, like, beginning of web 2.0, if you want to call it that, from, like, 2005 and so such. But um, What technology or engine were you using there? Yeah, What's I was that? curious about that. What engine or technology were you using? Yeah, was this, like, a homebrew system or... No, it's all just standard LAMP stack. And then I actually wrote my own, like, six degrees of separation function in there. Ah, which, I love that. Okay, to tell us about that function. How did you, did you apply numbers to everybody and then somehow... No, no, it was just a very, it's just a really big query uh, that works particularly well, but doesn't scale once you're, like, obviously... <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Really this. elegant SQL query. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. Cool. I still have that query because it's so <laughs> interesting how like that's great. It, so why didn't it scale? Is it just because it was just too many, too much of a table to query from, and it just became? Uh, it's because you multiply the same table over and over and over. It's like you have you have two columns, right, with like a pairing of like like user one and user two are friends, and then user two and user one are friends. Like it's reciprocal. Right. Um, and so then you have to like multiply this table and like minimize. It. You have to like find the path between people. It's just this kind of crazy query, but it's not complicated once you get the pattern. Gotcha. Wow. Um, but but again, like I, I'm sure that if I had like a million users and like you know you were looking for some six degree connection, it would just crash the database because right. like. It would Bloat the memory up. All right, well, so so let's hear it, man. What what ha like you actually? It looks like there's a landing page here. Like I'm sure you got a little bit of a back end. What did you ever get anybody on here? And how long did you try this? Yeah, no, no, Mesh Tennis was doing pretty well back in '06, and right. um, I I ended up like I ended up getting to like meet Pete Sampras and like return his serve at a at a big yes. stadium. And oh, that's oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah, it was. Um, it yeah, was that's, that's so great. Come on, you got to meet your heroes. What was that like, man? It, it was nerve wracking. Uh, and, and then I was talking to Billy Jean King, and like basically, uh, this guy told me to pitch Billy, or he was trying to explain mesh tennis to Billy. And then he said, "Well, Chris, I'll let you do it." And I started doing it. I didn't even know who she was at first because I hadn't seen a picture of her in like ten years. Okay. So I'm, I'm, and so then she's like, this is so great. This is such a great idea. Like, this is exactly what tennis needs. And I'm like, who is this That's woman? so awesome. But then she's so authoritative on tennis. And then it was like, I realized in the middle of the conversation, I was like, oh, yeah, my God. Yeah, you're like, oh, wait a minute. I was like, oh, my God, I know who this is. I'm such That's an idiot. That's so idiot. great. That's yeah. so great. So, you know hey, what? I Jeff, I, and I think I've said this on camera several times, you know, one of the reasons why I even do this Hangout, Chris, to be honest, is to meet people like you. Uh, I didn't know you were my hero, but you know you can yeah. get you can get up there one day. I mean, you're you're kind of already there with this really cool product, and, uh, and you were making money, uh, dude. This is like the holy grail. This is like everybody what everybody lives for. So maybe it'd be it'd be great to make a billion dollars and have the Zuckerberg money, but I'm sure this isn't so bad either. You know, <laughs> exactly. One day, you know, being able to pay your bills that's awesome. Yeah, no, it it it's been cool. Like I've tried to. I've definitely tried to like take advantage of it and like kind of work remotely from other places. Um, I spent most of, I hope this isn't like 
rubbing it in or like gloating because it's not meant to be. But I, <laughs> I'm a- I was going to say that I spent most of January in Maui and then I was like back in Maui in March and in Denver after that. And I was just, and I was still working and from these places. I have friends there. So I, oh, I want to go to Maui. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you guys live in like, the in the west coast it's not quite as amazing as when you come from boston so oh, gotcha you know yeah so i'm pretty think, happy down here in San Diego. i feel like we're going to appreciate it that little bit more all right no absolutely yeah, no, no it's I not gloating at all though we appreciate uh you know i think we said before the show we love to hear about where everyone's from on the show because we root for the underdogs and little guys and everyone that's not sitting right smack dab in silicon valley uh yeah. who's uh, still got the the fire and drive to to make something happen on the but own. but hold on a second before you say this jeff uh boston is like definitely coming up i mean boston yeah. is killing it right now uh what tell yeah. us about the boston yeah. scene chris uh give us your you know. it, Boston is a really great scene. Like, I do think it kind of gets, um, it, it doesn't get touted enough, but I think it's there. I'll never, I'll never say that, like, Boston is a great place for, um, like, consumer apps like S- Silicon Valley, but just the nature of the ecosystem, it's like the investors, the people, the community, um, the access to everyone, it's all there. Um, I just think it's like, it, it's kind of like a more down to earth version and, and kind of more realistic version of Silicon right. Valley. I think, I think Silicon Valley, you still get these kind of like pie in the sky dreamers and yeah. which is great because you right. do need that. And people right. need to be just like naively optimistic in right. this world, especially for entrepreneurship. But absolutely, but there's like a dose of pragmatism here that you, I think you miss a little on the West coast. Um, or Silicon Valley, but um, but you know it, it's just it's it's growing like crazy. I mean, literally, I I think about where like I've kind of been here in the scene since like 2007 when it, and I feel like it was just first starting to really get hot, like start to build here. And, okay. and granted, there've been here like don't get me wrong, there are people that have been here much longer than me and are even more entrenched. But right. um, but I just feel like now it's kind of nuts and there is like always an event going on. There's always a pitch thing. Yeah. There, yeah. Um, there's just so many startups now in like every kind of main neighborhood that you're, that it's almost like, oh, this, this is no longer like just this one area. Um, it's just like everywhere now. There's startups everywhere. And you're like, this is really cool. It's really yeah, because- Absolutely. I was going to say, Chris, uh, here in LA, there's all these like co-working spaces popping up like weeds. And, and then I think to myself, God, I should have, Least a place. I should have started this myself. I kicked myself in the head for that a little bit. How, how is it in Boston? Is there a lot of co-working everywhere? Have you noticed several popping up this year? Yeah, I, I would say in the past year there have been so many more that have popped up. There's certainly like a couple mainstays that have already been here for a few years and are doing great, and those are even expanding. But then there's also new ones popping up, and like it, I, it's just funny to think about that as like. A bubbleish kind of startup itself, but it right. kind of is. Yeah, yeah, it kind um, of is. Yeah. But at the same time, it's a little more. I don't know. It's a, it's kind of necessary because, like, if there's really that many more people working or working on their own or in small teams, then yeah, you just need that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely agree. It's cool. Uh, so let me connect real quick. Um, when you were working on your projects like Mesh Tennis and the other uh, projects early on that you were kind of hacking on. Were you? Did you have a day job? Like, how did you move from Johnson Johnson to the startup scene? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. What was the timing so, of that? Yeah. So the um, so basically, I was at Johnson Johnson from 2003 through uh, the end of 2006, and Tapgad, which was the original that SMS one that I built in like summer to summer fall 2005. Then I started working on mesh tennis and basically built that in like four months or six months, mainly from like fall 2005 to summer 2006. And this was all while I had a day job. And like, I actually think about how, so, you know, you talk about being in like Silicon Valley and um, uh, in like Boston and all these places. I would actually argue that it is easier to be motivated if you have a good idea you're into when you don't have a lot around you because there's less distraction and there's less like, you know, so I lived in New Brunswick, New Jersey at the time outside J&J headquarters and it was like, Mm -hmm. there was nothing to do but for me to go to the gym and like go play ultimate frisbee or something or basketball once a week 
Right. And like that was it. And otherwise, I just came home and worked on my startup. And you just coded, yeah. Yeah, and I literally would code from like 5 p.m. to like 1 a.m. with a dinner break. And like sometimes it happens. <laughs> That's so awesome. I love this lifestyle, Jeff. So you had an, if I'm wrong, you had an, awesome. Yeah, you had yeah. an environment to support your passion, right? And yeah, 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 totally. Um, yeah. So, and like I even think today, and, and this is, and, and I even say this is my biggest problem today is just like tuning out everything else. Because literally back then in 2005 and six. You didn't read anything but TechCrunch or Mashable, and there was only like two articles a day, or like right. at most five a day, right? So right. even if you just read the headlines or you weren't interested, there was nothing else to read right. aside from like you know global. Wow, news. that's so great! Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And now, and now, think about like every article on like this part of entrepreneurship and this part of building apps, and this, it's like everyone and their mom has written something about something, and you just and then everyone links to it. And you're like, oh, is this worth my time? You're like, am I going to learn something? And in reality, I'm like, no, I already know this. And then you're just like, delete. So <laughs> anyway, so, but that was, that was kind of the transition was just working. You know, I, I worked on weekends just, you know, I, I, kept, I kept things balanced. Like, I'd go out and, like, play a sport or see people or whatever, but then I'd come home and work for, like, five, six hours, you know, whatever it was. Um, so I literally got that done. Um, those things done. And then I actually started another company at the same time, but didn't work on it quite as much because I had a co-founder. So I just built like the core engine that the site ran on, and then he kind of built more of the front end stuff. Uh, oh, this, is, this was, sounds great. What, what is what market and what was the idea? So, so that was Fafaroxi, which was basically fantasy football for celebrity gossip. For like, celebrity it, gossip. Wait, it wait. Was, you just... It was the female version of fantasy football. Oh, okay. yeah, that's a good idea, actually. Sounds similar mean, to the uh, so, uh, what was it, the Hollywood Link Exchange back in the day? Yeah, Stock Exchange, Hollywood or, Stock Exchange. Yeah, so the SA, it was SA, similar, yeah. but our game was social. So like, you actually okay. played. You like, you had a draft with ah, your friends. You like got a team of ten celebs, and then basically you were trying to keep the celebs or get the celebs on your team who yeah. who were going to appear in the news the most over the course of the season. That's so um, great. That's a good idea. Yeah, it's a great so, idea. So we just basically, thank you. So we just basically built this engine that like scraped like 70 gossip blogs and parsed oh, out yeah. every celebrity name and then we like assigned yeah. points if they were on yeah. your team. So, so what happened? I mean, this sounds like a good idea. So basically, so, so okay, so basically now my partner moves to Boston six months before me just for other reasons. I then end up getting an offer from, a, a, so, then, so then this VC in London found my tennis site Okay. Send me a message through the site. Said, I, I love your site. I want to meet you. Oh. I meet him in New York City, and he says, come work for this startup I funded in Boston. And, okay. and he, they had like a similar kind of like, they were doing like a hyper-local <clears throat> thing, which is very similar to like next door, the neighborhood social network. That right, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was similar to that. And like every block which sold to like MSNBC. So... Anyway, so I was like, okay, so I go interview with these guys. I ended up taking the job. I was like, I'm ready to leave J&J. I'm going to go work for a startup. And literally, I was like, I'm going to go run, like be a part of a three-person startup with no risk. Like they're going to give me a salary. So I'm like, right. yeah. yeah. At the same time, I get an offer from Facebook. And which what? I was like, Facebook? Yeah. Okay, what year was this again? <laughs> yeah, when was this? Yeah, this was fall 2006. So 2006. Yeah. So this wow. is like I don't even want to tell you the pain that like I think about with this. <laughs> but uh, uh, you're kidding. You turned them down. <laughs> I, I so ultimately so here's what happened. Basically, I had an interview. I it was like an hour. I didn't think it went all that well. Like okay. he didn't seem that into me. Like and, and whatever. So after a week, I didn't hear from them. So I say, hey guys, thanks anyways. I'm going to take this other job offer. And they're like, no, we loved you. Fly out here as soon as you can. And I was like, oh, but I already took the other job offer. And they were like, we don't care. Fly out here. I was like, wow, that's ballsy. Wow. So, yeah. So I fly out there four days later and do like basically, I was like, let's see if I can do this in 24 hours. So fly out there, interview for five hours. At the end of the five hours, they were like, okay, we're going to give you an offer. And it was like 20% better than my other offer which was totally like arbitrary because they like 
asked me like what I was gonna, what I got in the other offer. Right, I right. So you can make up whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so they, and then I like flew home that night, and I was like, oh my! I, I took the red eye back and went right into work, and I was like, what the hell do I do? Wow. So I like toiled over it, and I was just like, okay, I'm not gonna make this decision about the money because now if you if you think about this at the time, right? MySpace sold for 580 million. And now yeah. Facebook was already worth a billion dollars. So oh, I'm this like, was okay. Yeah, yeah, right. This was when Yahoo had apparently put in the billion dollar bid. So that was like their valuation for the most part. And they told me that was their valuation. So I'm like, okay, there's no way this company's not going to sell for like three or five billion. And even if they IPO, what are they going to be worth? Ten billion? I was like, come on. Like, so I did the math and I was like, do I go work for uh, be employee 150? At Facebook, which I know is an amazing company, and I was obsessed with social networking already. They basically, yeah. like, Mesh Tennis was basically my job interview. Like, right they, even, yeah. they actually took a feature from Mesh Tennis and put it into Facebook. Oh, oh wow. That? Tell us. So, yeah. so I, I created this notion of attaching media to a message. So in okay. Mesh Tennis, like, when you were trying to figure out where to play with someone, people would be like, which court? Which court are you talking about? Oh, yeah. So I said, so I made the ability to attach a court to a message, and then it renders the map of where the court is in the oh. message. Okay. And so they, and so the guy, the one of the engineers of Facebook was like, "That's a really good idea. I like it." And then a month later, you could attach media to Facebook posts. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. They move quick around there. I yeah. It, well, well, that that guy built it himself. Um. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, uh. So basically, I'm just toiling over this. I'm like trying to do the math. I'm like, okay, let's not make the decision about money. Which do I think is really going to be the better job for me? And it was like employee 150 or like employee three if I really want to do a startup. Oh. You know, so, but then the other question was, do I want to do a startup because I want to be my own boss and I have, or I have ideas I want to build or is it because I want to be rich? And uh, like, these are all great questions. Uh, these yeah, are all really great it. questions. Yeah, I, and honestly, I feel like I lied to myself a little, like I, 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 or maybe I didn't, because I thought being an entrepreneur was the fastest way to get rich, which is really dumb in reality. Uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so anyway, so point is, I ended up saying like, there's no way that Facebook's gonna like, even if I get all the options and whatever, it's still not gonna be, you know, worth that much. I, I go run a company and raise a Series A, and I'll be worth more on paper. Right. Than I am with Facebook. Now, granted, right. that's paper, which right. is a good distinction. Right, right, absolutely. Um, well, so I anyway. can tell you, Chris. Uh, you know, coming on the call today, Jeff. You know, uh, did we have any idea this guy was being courted by Facebook? And no clue. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's you know, it's one of the little dots in in the line. Oh yeah, that's a great story to have. Yeah. Uh, you know. I mean, this is awesome. I, you know, taking inspiration from your network. Uh, no, I'm glad that I you you told us how you got. You know, you went from computer science to kind of a, a evening hacker to getting kind of fully embedded in the startup scene, and now you're trying to make these decisions. Do I go work for, you know, Facebook startup of 150 people, or or a real little team where you maybe have more influence? Yeah, and like it's it's on your shoulders. You're the product. I was going to be the product development manager, or whatever, and mm -hmm. you know. And then there was like the CTO and kind of the CEO, and that was like basically it. And then like a part time designer. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so ultimately, and then when I turned it down, the the director of product, she was like, "Why don't you talk to Mark?" She's like, well, "Just hear Mark out about the future and the vision." I was like. No, I made my decision. Like, I don't want to waste his time. Right. And all I think to myself after reading the Steve Jobs bio, every single person that talked to Steve Jobs that didn't want to talk to him ended up going to work for Apple. And oh. it's like, here I am, like, no, I don't want to talk to Mark. And I was That's like, so I'm such an idiot. First of all, I would have loved to tell people I talked to Mark Zuckerberg. He, like, <laughs> tried to convince me to join Facebook. Yeah. And do I do that? No. I just. I was just so <laughs> like, I don't want to waste his time. <laughs> <laughs> I, is, come on, Chris. Is, is that really your motivation, or were you just like, I don't want to talk to him. I want to build this other thing. Yeah, were you uh, afraid he was going to convince you, or? No, I don't. I was like trying to be the good guy. Like, oh, I want to be noble. Like, I made my decision. I'm not going to let oh, Mark cool. Zuckerberg sway me. Yeah. No, I do yeah. think that is noble. I mean, yeah. then you go back to your team in Boston, and you know, you're a hero. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You're absolutely a hero. Yeah. I mean, they didn't know about any of this going on. Okay. okay. Well. 
right? I, I didn't go back to them and say, hey, I got a better offer from Facebook. Up your offer. Like, I, I didn't do anything. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. No, it's really, it's but great. It means it's a lot, like burning, though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's almost like burning your bridges in a sense, you know? Yeah, I know. And, and that was certainly something I thought of because the guys I worked with up here are like two of the smartest guys I've ever met. And granted, like, that startup didn't end up going anywhere in the long run, but oh, okay. uh, but they're still amazing guys, and they ended up actually selling their next company to e uh, to PayPal. So because oh. they ended up developing this really interesting patent on like mobile uh, Wi-Fi like translocation for payments, it was kind of nuts. Wow! So um, uh, they have a PayPal exit. PayPal probably had a good chunk of change to give these guys. I mean, granted, they were like pre-launch, pre-revenue. Like, I, I don't really know where they were exactly, but it was enough that they were happy. Like, wow. Well, I have to tell you, Chris, I had no idea this the story would end up like this. This is like, like, yeah. Well, that, now we just got to Boston. Yeah. No, that's just <laughs> yeah. That's just to get to the the startup scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is wow. what we're no, so passionate but, about. But anyways, that that kind of answers the question, uh, Jeff. Of like, you know, so basically, it was all just working part time on the side as mm -hmm. much as I could, and then, uh, and then basically, once I came and joined that startup, Bafarazzi ended up growing like crazy. As my, like my partner and I were both here in Boston, but he was working on it full time at that point. And so basically, he was like, we were like, we were both like, look, there's a startup scene here. We should go raise money and do this full time, or we're gonna regret it. Um, and so we like lit, quit our jobs. Like the way I became a full time entrepreneur, the second the iPhone went on sale. That's how I remember it. It was oh, wow. like, it was like you know June thirtieth, like six p.m. or whatever. Well, what was the significance with the iPhone? Yeah, I know, right? And now I finally have an iPhone. I didn't even <laughs> until like four months ago. Um, wow. Why did you buy I'm just curious. It's kind of random. What, what's what, that? Why did you finally get an iPhone? Oh, because I, had an, I, I was on Verizon, and so I had an Android phone leading up to that. And then once they were finally on Verizon, I still had to wait out the contract. Okay. So okay. Dumb, dumb, dumb stuff. Dumb reasons. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So what uh, was it about the launch, though? What's that? What was it about the launch of the iPhone then that uh, triggered this for you? Oh, no, nothing. It was just that was when I quit. Yeah. Like, okay, I so ran up my gotcha. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Milestone that we can't forget, yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. Like my, yeah. So that's just how I remember it. Um, but anyway, so then my partner and I lived at, like, literally below the poverty line for, like, <laughs> six months to seven months. Uh, and we were – basically, we had this VC in New York that contacted us because his wife is a doctor, and he called us because he was like, you guys have taken my wife away from me for 45 minutes a night. And he's like, <laughs> like our site, Fafarazzi. So he was uh -huh. like, if you're doing this to my wife, I need to meet you guys. Ah. And so and that was literally how it happened. And That's then, awesome. Uh, basically, like, we, we pitched everyone in Boston, and they all said no. They all said, like, come back for your Series A or or still too risky, or like, I like this idea, but you know, we don't do consumer like seed stuff. Because you remember in 2007, Boston was like unheard of for like anything less yeah. than three to five million dollars and certainly no consumer, right? Yeah, and yeah, we yeah. are being this little like consumer play. Right. So anyways, um, so, so basically this VC in New York did the deal uh, after a, a false start with them, like, we pitched the whole firm in July in New York, and they turned us down. And then, uh, basically, like he said, "Look, guys, I'm going to work with you once a week. You can have my time. I'll help however I can until we get this deal done." That's and great. basically, Bafarazzi just like tripled in size over the next few months. And he was like, "Okay, we're ready to do the deal now." Right, right. He was wow. there. Yeah. I was like, "Why?" Just because. The trip yeah. size, like yeah. it's just so ridiculous. You know what, Chris? I think you've nailed something that I've felt, and so, and and I think you just put it into words. There's so many people that'll say no because they're just getting to know you, they're hearing the pitch. But if you can somehow, you know, get them involved in some manner and uh, have them give them weekly updates, it really increases your chances if you're growing. And yeah. But the interesting thing is that was his idea. He. He really wanted to do the deal, which was like really um, inspiring to us and like kind of made us feel like um, he kind of earned the deal. Like because then we ended up having one other VC who on the West Coast who wanted to do the whole deal himself. Okay. 
and we ended up turning him down because we were like, no, this guy's been working with us the whole yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have a relationship, yeah. Yeah, so totally. We're like, we're not going to dick this guy over. He earned yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so we, so we raised about 850K and wow. ran – we ran it like a super cheap startup. I mean, literally didn't pay ourselves more than 40K a year. Okay. Um, and uh, anyway, so I was there full time for two years. And then my partner and I, as I like to say, we, we got an amicable divorce. And, uh, and then how does he, that happen, amicable divorce because between partners? How do you, how do, you do that? I mean, you know, we we were we started like arguing about things, and there was like I don't know personal dynamics going on that just weren't um, like I. It's honestly like I analyzed this all the t like back then. I thought about it a lot. I don't know where it came from. I don't really know what changed, but I think a lot of it was just the pressures of like having to perform, having to grow, having to make money. It was like yeah. you people get really like. If we don't do it, if we don't focus, if we don't work harder, if we don't work like, if you don't do what I say, and that's when yeah. like this partnership kind of dissolves. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, you get extra bossy. Maybe somebody would feel like they're not doing enough work or whatever. It, there's a million reasons. The key thing was that we were personal friends, anyways, and so yeah, we kind of said good. like, all right, let's let's end this here before we're like never going to talk to each other again. And right, we were right. we were fine. We only had like a couple bad arguments. But basically like it was for the best, you know, he by the way, the the evolution of the company was that we ended up um coming out with reality TV fantasy games. So this is like okay. if you're watching oh. Top Chef, you can wow. pick like the three characters you think will do the best in that episode and then wow. we score the episodes that night after what? the show airs and Wow, and so this was like a little that. interface uh based around the show? What's that? So it was like a little GUI interface and all that? The Oh, the site, it was a big site. There was a lot of functionality and like it actually kind of bothers me to think that like, you know, we all have that code somewhere still in the database obviously like but it's all yeah. gone. It's just I can't like say go check out the site. If you actually go to the Internet Archive, yeah, you can yeah. See yeah. Jeff, can you pull this up? I want to see this actually, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. This sounds really cool because I mean, Jeff and I have been you know veterans of failed startups, and we've spent all this time and blood and sweat, and it's gone. It's just dust, digital dust. And yes. uh, by the way, speaking of, I like we haven't talked about you guys at all. I don't know if we should do that. This offline. isn't about us. It's all about you. This is the all right, all right, tell our show yeah. today. All right. Yeah. We'll do it offline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this is this is all about you. Um, yeah, uh, really briefly, Jeff, both and I f met each other at an entertainment startup, and we spent you know several years working on a product. And can you give us the name of this one more time so I can type it in? Oh, it's it's f a f a r a z z i. Dot com. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, so that, I mean, no, that the the, the uh, assets got acquired. Now you have to go to yeah. the Internet Archive. So yeah, go to the Internet Archive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't see. It, yeah, you know, I watched a archive, really great but... video about the archive. I didn't know it was like in this church or. Have you ever seen this video? No. no. Oh, it's awesome! It's really <laughs> great. There's this old school church in San Francisco, like, reno You know, it's no longer a church. It's basically a big, uh, cooled uh, warehouse for this Internet Archive servers. It's amazing, <laughs> and oh. it's it's in a church. I was like, wow, this is so cool, and. Uh, and they showed off all this hardware and how it's all temperature controlled and everything. And and then you walk outside and it's this, this church and it's, it was really cool. It's an amazing service they offer. I'm um, having a little bit of trouble pulling it up. But I, the idea, though, Amul and I kind of share some uh, the space a little bit. In Hollywood, we were kind of in a uh, – they were trying to do a lot of stuff with celebrities. Um, yeah. You know, gamification is super hot right now. I, my my gears are just turning because uh, I, I love games and creativity and trying to, you know, make these things. And I, I can imagine you guys could get lost pretty quickly in trying to come up with different, uh, you know, game styles. Like you said, with the reality TV comes on and you can create micro games around each thing. But yeah. uh, that could get you kind of distracted quickly, I, I bet, or, or having a, a massive code base. or um, but, but it sure does sound fun and attractive to those in... Uh, you know that are all in the celebrity space, or that are completely. Yeah, no. In I it. mean, we we did try to keep coming up. Uh, hold on, let me make sure this isn't muted. Okay, uh, I we did try we did try to keep coming up with new games, but we just had like kind of the two primary ones. Um, so what here. what happened? Just really, just really briefly, if you can. Did, I know you guys had your issues, but what 
did, were you guys not making any money? Did you have a hard time pulling people back in, paying for stuff, getting advertiser? What was it? Uh, no, it wasn't here. Uh, Jeff, I got a link I'm going to send sure. you okay. guys uh, through the chat. Perfect. Um, uh, here we go. Okay, there it is. Um, no, so basically... We so we were making a good bit of money initially because oh. we had this ad contract with Glam, which was a guaranteed CPM just based on traffic. Meaning, like mm -hmm. the more page views we, that we got, the more money we made, regardless of if, if they showed an ad. Oh, great! Yeah, so it was great. We were making yeah. quite a bit of money, yeah. and then our and our traffic started to balloon. So we were like, oh wow, we're making quite a bit of money. Yeah. But the, the idea with the business had always been that we're going to be an ad-supported business. So originally we were like, when we had our bootstrap heads on, we were like, okay, we're going to charge for the leagues and whatever. Right. And then we were like, okay, well, we're, we just raised VC money, so now we got to just focus on growth and user acquisition. So we're like, we're just going to be ad-supported in the meantime. Right. We're going to try and just grow, grow, grow. Because until you get to like a million users, that was like the magic mark of like a million uniques. Like... You right. couldn't really make that much money with advertising. Okay. Uh, but then we were like, okay, well, part of our business model, too, is going to be white labeling these games to the big networks and building mm -hmm. out those relationships and whatever. And so we did end up being the fantasy game for, like, almost every major reality show. And so um, that must have pulled you some decent traffic. Yeah. No, not no? really. Because okay. the thing was is that as part of the deal, they're paying us, right? And so the – so um, – Basically, it was like the traffic's all being kept on their site. Now, we had said, like, we were talking about, neg we negotiated that we could still serve an ad in the game, like, in the iframe, like, there post, like, right. they showed on their site. Right. But even so, it was like, you know, it's still, you would think that, like, Bravo w emailing all their subscribers would get, like, you know, a bunch of people playing, but it was never that many. It's like, I think the most... I think the most the network got was like 10k or something users playing their games. So wow, really okay, bad. yeah, that's that's really small. I'm looking at the site, man. I have to tell you, it's beautifully designed, and it's yeah. looks like it's fairly functional. I mean, he's hovering over these JavaScript menus, and yeah, that's really funny, actually. And I wonder if the link. I'm going to click on one of these links here yeah, on my side. Okay. Oh, it does work. Oh wow, yeah, it does so we work. Got some yeah. landing pages and some of the. Uh, you got some the, broken uh, images, but. Yeah. Well, wow. I think the images fill in just slowly. Yeah, this is oh, a oh yeah. Oh my god, that's hilarious! You can play the face off and every. This is oh really, really? All still fun. Oh, stuff. the games work too. Nostalgic. Uh, yeah, this is pretty awesome. So, no, was this kind of pre-social media as well? Yeah. Um, you didn't get, you know, was there much uh, social media buzz? It seems like this would be really popular with, you know, that crowd. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, like, we enabled it. We, of course, put, like, tweet, you, you know, the ability to post on Facebook and tweet, like, everywhere that was appropriate. But, it, like, there certainly wasn't the mass of people on Twitter that's there now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's the ironic thing with this timing. It's like, right. you know, I, I mean, I'm sure our business would have done a little better if we had the breadth of, social media today, but, right. you know. You God, Chris, I have to look at this and think to myself, this this would hurt if, if I was looking at it and I built this thing. How do, like, by the, what? Way, by the way, you see the little Fafa head in the corner? That was like everyone, all the users, that was like their favorite thing. So we would always change the Fafa head, like based on whatever was going on. Yeah. Uh, and, and we yeah. always tried to find like the most ridiculous but funny picture of that event for whatever they were mentioned. That's mm -hmm. great. So the Brit like the shaved head of Britney was probably the all time funniest. That, that's awesome. I want you to hit refresh on this. I want to see a few yeah. more of these. Yeah, I'll keep going to some other pages, see if we can yeah. find some. So find some more of these heads. Wow. Um I have to tell you, man, so uh, all right, so I, l correct me if I'm wrong, but you're saying you guys just didn't make enough money. Well, no, it was that it was the classic. I mean, when when you talk to a VC about what is the number one reason a startup fails, they will tell you they ran out of money, and that and that technically is what happened in this case. Like, okay. I left the company after two years. Todd kept running it. Uh, he moved the company down to Brooklyn uh, since yeah. most of our like clients and whatever was all in New York, and it just made gotcha. sense to be there. Right. Um, he moved the company to Brooklyn, and. 
basically it was like he kept operating the company was making you know six figures at one point but you know that still doesn't support that many people uh, well, in I, any kind of normal could, salary could, could could you guys could you guys could have laid off a bunch of people and possibly kept it running on a skeletal sca- staff no, it, it was run on a skeleton it was okay. like five people four people All right. the entire time gotcha um so, I mean, that was the thing. We made 850K last for six years. That's Wait, good. Let, yeah. let me think about that. Actually, you know, I think about it. 2008. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was more like it was like more like four and a half years, but that's still okay. a ridiculous amount yeah, of money. That, that is. That is. You're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You, know, you yeah. talk about VC or startups these days that raise like three to five million dollars and raise their next round like eight months later. Because they already like. What, what is, uh, so? I, this is a favorite question I get to ask, and I'm and I'm going to ask it. What is the big takeaway lesson that we you can impart to us and the audience from this failed experiment? The one big one. I mean, I'm sure there's forty. Well, that's interesting. You mean with Fafarazzi specifically? Just in yeah le- yeah. Let's say uh, maybe even some of your other past mistakes. You know. I think the number one thing is, and, I, and I'm guilty of this too, picking something to work on and just doing it and putting it out there, like marketing the hell out of it. Okay. Because I've seen that a lot of people, including myself, are sometimes not good at promoting their own thing right. or they're not good at focusing on distribution, which is always, in fact, that's the number one thing. Okay. Focusing on distribution. Right. Because a lot of people these days can build a decent little product, a, a hack, a feature, maybe even a business. Right. But to build a business, you need to solve distribution. And yeah. if you don't, you're done. I love it. That's that's my number one. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, I, and it's hard. Like that's the thing. I don't think people realize how hard it is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've gotten pretty lucky with follow up. And I still haven't solved the distribution problem to this day. So, you know, the more well, things said, I can do to get it out there, the better. Well, hold on a second, Chris. You did say earlier on uh, word of mouth or word of mouth has been really helpful for you and probably the best converting. Would you say, isn't there any, do you have any ideas on how to stimulate that and engage it every few months and push it a little harder? So I think there's a lot of product things I can do, which I've been, you know, starting to look at in terms of incentives, referrals, you know, like asking people, just literally asking people to tell five new people yeah, and get yeah, them just them asking for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just asking. But that's all like within the product and the business itself, or sorry, within the product itself. But yeah. if you ask me, like, what Google ad campaign I could buy to like get users effectively, right. no clue. And you've have you spent some money? Have you tested a bunch of keyword ad groups and all that? Uh, I have looked at a couple. I tried a couple. I okay. don't think they converted well. All right, um, so you've been burned. So you're saying, ah, I lost some money. I don't want to do this again. Uh, it was. I mean, it wasn't probably enough money to say for sure that I've been burned. But I think the problem is like, even intuitively, when I think about who uses follow up, it's so varied. It's kind of crazy, and it's like, in some sense. There's the like startup early adopter, you know, kind of crowd. Right. And then you also I have this like range of customers that are like totally just like random employees at corporations who just mm-hmm. like it and it works right. for them. Yeah. And I'm just like I, I don't know how I would ever reach that person. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So how about we just focus on startups? Have you thought about hitting beta lists and getting maybe an ad buy there or, or- No, so don't get me wrong, startups are a fantastic source of customers. Like I yeah. would say that the majority of my yeah. customers are like CEOs yeah. of They're startups. They're just like just like me and Jeff, we're just tech yeah. geeks. Yeah, just one of every predict um, productivity at, you know, thing trying to, to make the most of our inbox. Yeah. yeah. But but I will say that that crowd is also the first crowd to potential that is at least always in the know about what's out there. Mm-hmm. So if they're not 100% happy with follow up, then they might churn or they might use two tools in combination. Yeah, you're absolutely um, right about that. Yeah. You know, versus the like person who just like comes across my tool, it totally works for them, or they make it fit for them, and they're happy, and they're not like always looking for the newest right. and greatest. Tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're definitely a fickle crowd, and very, very, very hard to win over all the time. Yeah. But uh, 
Yeah, I have to tell you, Chris, uh, when I saw this, I was like, oh, we got to get him on the show, Jeff. We have to get him on the show <laughs> somehow. I mean, email is super hot. I think you have a product that is so simple and beautiful. I, I, my background is in engineering and uh, product manager, and uh, you know, nothing delights me more than a, a simple, clean uh, product uh, like you have. Uh, the fact that I don't have to download anything and, yeah, and you have to install anything. It, um, yeah. I think it's super attractive. I mean, I think that, like you're saying, you're going to get some early adopters uh, that also are early adopting other things like mailbox app and whatever else and uh, hopefully you get some good feedback from them uh, as to you know where things are going and where their trends are uh, but, yeah yeah I do know, I don't know if they're the um, yeah what your uh, what your huge core of customers will be uh, but I mean everyone can use this tool right we've seen some other email apps that uh, specifically call out salespeople uh, bec or people that have you know um, are really using email all day long you know sitting in their inbox uh, but you know, I think uh, what you've got is something more broad, right? Like even your mom could use this, probably. Yeah, you could, yeah. you could say I know those other guys who target salespeople. <laughs> All right, so let's get yeah. into it. Uh, we actually right. had the founder and CEO of Yesware on a few episodes ago. I don't know if you noticed. Oh God, no, I didn't. I, I know my fellows pretty well. Uh, come on, I know you've watched the video. Come on, please tell no, me you watched I the video. I did not know. Damn that. it! I can't believe you didn't watch the video, Jeff. How <laughs> you, did this distribution, happen? Amol. We got to work on our distribution. <laughs> I think I, here's the thing: you guys have my email, and you didn't yeah. eat, like you didn't add me oh. to a mailing list, which I have. He's expect. right. He's absolutely right. We're horrible. Yeah. <laughs> so you suffer the same problem I do. See? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're uh, still trying to cross that off our to-do yeah, list. Yeah, you know, uh, actually, sure. to, to that point, yesterday or on July 4th, I finally sent our first mass email. And it was very wow. scary, and I was like, oh, should I do this, should I do this? And then I thought, you know, I'm being silly. These are human beings that we interviewed that probably enjoyed the interview. We're laughing maybe a couple of times. What's, what's the harm? And I yeah. said, I went ahead and emailed it. Yeah, no, you should. Here's the most important thing. If there's an unsubscribe link, you're safe. It doesn't matter then, right? Because, uh, granted, you might lose people if you don't like make a good email. But so long there's that unsubscribe link and it's like a one-click unsubscribe, no one is going to bitch about it. Okay, I like that. I didn't have an unsubscribe on that one, but <laughs> next time. Yeah. Well, I mean, right? Because then, if you don't have the unsubscribe, everyone, everyone's gut reaction is like, "I hate you." You better take me off this thing, or I'm gonna, yeah. you know, report spam and kill you yeah. and whatever. Yeah, I, I, I you know what? I, I'm so glad we're talking okay. about this. Jeff and I have been have had this huge conflict because it's restricting our growth. And well, how do you feel about unsolicited cold emails? When I cold emailed you, how did that feel to you? Uh, I mean, granted, but I'm a guy who runs a business, so that happens to me. So I, you have to remember, like. That you get like I'm I get inbound requests for things, so it's not that odd. If it was like, if if it was to like my personal email and I had no clue who you were, or how you got it, or why you really were contacting me, I would have just been like, what the hell, like spam, right? But and I actually don't try to click spam much because uh, I feel bad. Like knowing as someone who runs an email business, right. I can't. Someone... I know. I was gonna say, oh my god, spam's the worst. When you get that button, it's really hard. I mean, I've seen people register for follow up and then click the spam button on the confirmation email. Right. And I'm like, oh no, moron. And I like, sometimes it's actually a spam bot doing it on purpose. What? Wow. But I think other times there have just been real people that just had no clue what they were doing. Yeah. Like, yeah. they just just are internet dumb, and it's fine. Right. I, I don't yeah. want them to be a customer. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask about email then, real quick. The infrastructure and where do you see email as uh, you know the platform that it is uh, in the future of the internet? You know, we have some of these building blocks like you know we've mentioned in the past in the show like IRC or FTP, and you know we've got HTTP, the web. And now we've got all these native apps. Um, you know, I love how you're plugging into email as it exists today. Uh, I mean, do you think it's going to continue to exist this way for a while, or do you think these Native clients are going to muddle it up. Ah, great so, question. So I think one, I think one way to think about it is, email is like a really. You, you guys understand like technical architecture stuff. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, so all I was going to say is like, most scalable internet systems are built on the system on like a system of messages and queues and all this, right? Mm -hmm. Email yeah. is an asynchronous queue. And so if you think about it, that's like really the most scalable type of infrastructure. Right. Um, 
Yeah, granted, when someone mail someone's mailbox fills up, then you have a problem. But most right. people, you know, there's someone usually monitoring their mailbox. Mm -hmm. So, I think like people building apps on top of this and like redoing native clients. I actually think it's a good thing. I mean, I would like to see Gmail have competition. I would like to see, yes. um, you know, because I want Gmail to keep getting better. And like some of the things they've done have been a little like that was kind of weird or this is now kind of goofy and like whatever. Mm -hmm. But I still use it because it's still kind of the best email client out there. Now some people are super, now Gmail when it gets slow, I am like ready to smash my monitor, right? <laughs> and so some, some native mail clients like even Apple Mail, people always talk about how like when they use Apple Mail, like you hit send and it's gone. Like you just move on to the next email. But right. even if it couldn't connect to Gmail and send the email, it's still like queuing that up. So it's like you almost have another layer, which is like, I don't know why Gmail doesn't do this, where it just kind of queues them offline and then syncs. I, I think they try to do this or they have this feature, but it's just not very well done yet. Right. So anyway, so I just think that like, as a platform, email's here to stay. The infrastructure is. And I think people will build more interesting interfaces on top of it. Um, and I think the interesting thing is that Gmail is probably going to still be at the heart of this revolution because they're still the most open platform. Like if you look at other IMAP providers, they don't like give you as much data. And the fact that like Gmail has like the native threading and gives you these thread IDs, yeah. that like makes a really big deal because I would, you know, first of all, I would never want to do anything without like a threaded email system anymore. Yeah. Okay. Um, but Gmail also does go to a lot of lengths to protect itself such as what I was saying before about like if you just try to be a plugin that sits in the interface, you actually have no clue like what the email is referencing by the URL and just stuff like this. So they're, they're have this balance of like security and access. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's always cool. the big tension. Yeah, security and access. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, it's good to get your two cents on that. Uh, having earlier in the show mentioned, you know, some of the uh, the protocol and you know how it's not like super rigid, and it's always one of those interesting things as a developer when you have to start, uh, you know, looking at a email headers. And I, I think what you said is right on. The fact that it uh, the technology can continue to be a platform for uh, great applications in the future. Like yeah. You said, it's based on a simple message queuing kind of uh, protocol, which is like uh, really what most apps require. Yeah. Well, you know, we we've, we've been talking here for over an hour and usually this is where I go into my whole all right, well, thanks for being on the show. You know, gee, gee you know, it's been awesome. We're going to get in touch again and all that. But we don't have to do that. We can keep talking. I I just want to be uh, you know, uh, respectful of your time. How are you doing on time today? I I'm okay. Yeah, it's okay. Fine. Well, great. Uh, if you want, we can talk about uh, your company. We could talk about email in general. Uh, what are, is there any question you want to ask us? Well, so you guys alluded to your startup, but uh, uh, well, actually, I, no, I have a better question. So, who do you consider your competition? Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, the first person that comes to mind is Andrew Warner from Mixergy. Oh, uh, interesting. I, I don't really consider him a. Com what was that? Big follow-up customer and fan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I I love him. I love what he's done, and I, I you know he he's, he was a huge inspiration for this. And uh, I don't want to think of him as a competitor because I would like to just grow the pie and you know all that. You know I'm not a whole zero sum game kind of person, even though sometimes I am. But uh, uh, yeah, I just I, <laughs> yeah. Him, so I don't... When Amul and I kicked this off, I don't think we had a very um... You know, sharp business strategy at it. Yeah, really yeah, we had no business strategy. At competitors actually. or uh, you know, we're not trying to be apples to apples with anyone. Or uh, yeah. you know, we're kind of looking at other people. Well, basically, Amul is a fan of Mixergy. I've also listened to some of his stuff. Not a huge fan, uh, but I think the interviews are great. I, I've watched some stuff like This Week in Startups um, yeah, and things startup, like yeah. Stanford E Corner and a lot of those sorts of things. Where I, you know, while I was working at a startup, I'd be sitting there. You know, wanting to start my own thing and watching these kinds of videos, going, "Holy shit! These are these guys' stories. They're just lighting a fire under my ass." Going, "This is yeah. what I did. This is possible," uh, and kind of giving some of the nitty gritty of it. And uh, I think Calicana said in one of his shows, like, really, it was a it's a trick for him to be able to interview these brilliant entrepreneurs and kind of figure out uh, their secret sauce, or at least you know, 
kind of do some of the legwork for them, learn from their mistakes and all of this stuff uh, has been my goal. And, and and when we kicked off on the podcast, it was largely a way for us to actually have an outlet for content marketing. And, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, we never know where it's going to go exactly, which is half the fun. Yeah, no, I think it's great. I mean, I think like uh, most people who run a business are more than happy to like kind of talk about, you know, what's going on, promote something if they have it, um, you know, and obviously like get, hopefully develop, deliver some insights and advice if they can and like, you know, as you were alluding to. So one thing I'll point out, which I think is actually an interesting distinction is, so Andrew's a big customer and fan of follow-up, but oh. I haven't been on his show. Okay. So if you think about this, this is kind of a segmentation issue and maybe a story issue because Andrew's show is based on like, successful kind of growth in startups and like people with like interesting success stories but he kind of is you know and and I don't know Andrew personally like we've just emailed a couple times but it okay. seems to me that it's mostly based on like some level of revenue or a, or, or kind of a growth curve or right, user right. Growth. like right he just yeah. wants something to kind of hook onto as the yeah, story yeah. absolutely but here you guys are interviewing me and you knew nothing about me yeah so, yeah. so what I'm saying is that like you guys are now, in a sense, Andrew's kind of like the first search result, and you guys are the long tail. And so <laughs> you have an opportunity to build out yeah. content for the people who aren't in his eye yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you he know, certainly has a filter that he kind of keeps people out. I think even when Amul and I were do driving, uh, we were listening to an episode, and I think he mentioned some of that, like, like oh, I wasn't going to have you on, but then we talked and I had you on. and. I think yeah. he's got some rough edges with competitors and some some stuff. Uh, we are certainly raw and kind of uh, live, and don't mind putting it out there. And we love to hear what you have to say. You know, give people a a, a platform to to tell their stories because you know we we don't like to pigeonhole people and to require that you have you know you have the hockey stick or or you IPO'd or something crazy. We you know we love the long haul stories actually, the people who took years and years to get where they are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I it's kind I, of funny when you guys started asking about all this other stuff in the past. Like I just, it's like I had forgotten. I just haven't talked about it in a while. No, it's <laughs> great. Well, you have. That, yeah, that's one of the the gems I think of this show is actually documenting some of those stories that uh, yeah. other people might be afraid to talk about, or you know, maybe they'll ask, "Oh, what was a great mistake you made?" But uh, I love to hear the progression from you know how you left Johnson, you know, corporate job to to startup land and and all the turmoil within. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was quite a quite a quite a story, man. I had no idea it was gonna be all this twists and turns, and uh, yeah, it was the very. Thing, it feels so linear. Like it just feels like a line, until I guess maybe post paparazzi. Like then it started to feel like what. So this is actually an interesting point, mm -hmm. which was like when I left paparazzi, I definitely went through this like, what the hell do I do now? Because. I had like at like 25 years old, I'd kind of achieved everything I already thought I wanted, which was like running a VC back startup. You know, like that was it. That's all. I just wanted to keep doing that. And so now all of a sudden it was like, well, what do I do now? Do I get a job again? Like that sucks. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but then of course there are mesh of like HubSpot comes along, and I've known him for a couple of years, and like he gave me like the most interesting job offer I could ever get. Yeah, let's hear it. I want to hear this one. Well, no, I mean, he just come said, be the entrepreneur at HubSpot. And I was like, holy shit, yeah, that sounds great. Like, I mean, so tell, tell us a little bit about Dermish. What, what is he like? Oh, my God. He's like the most genuinely nice, smart, like most intelligent, thoughtful, just down-to-earth person you'll ever meet. Like humble is probably like not a good enough word because he's oh, just like, wow. he's sounds like, really like uh, what, what's it? He's almost um, like self, uh, oh, my God. Word I'm looking for. Anyways, he just he like doesn't even give himself enough credit, even though That's he's cool. like the most successful of all all of us. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's done huge. I mean, HubSpot is massive. Yeah. yeah. So he's just he's just a really really good guy, and which was um, one of the reasons I of course wanted to work with him and had a great experience working with him, um, and just kind of made me also feel better about like the HubSpot management team and its longevity and where it was going to go and all that. How did how did uh, how did that when I okay I'm ready to leave you know I'm going to do this thing full time how, how did that conversation go with him? It was fine. I mean he's super supportive of entrepreneurs and like there was kind of a timing factor. There was kind of a timing factor too in the sense that um, 
HubSpot, like I had built enough stuff in labs that now like it was kind of getting uh, uh, integrated into the main core product, which was not like what I worked on. And so then it was turning into like a maintenance job where I was just like, because we didn't actually have money to hire more people for the labs team. Okay. So it was like, okay, well, now I'm just maintaining this and I'm bug fixing and like adding little features that like, you know, the CEO or other people are asking me and I'm just like, this is not labs anymore. And then Darmesh had his kid. So it was just kind of time like, I was just like, labs is kind of like done. I think labs is just okay. going to go back to Darmesh. Gotcha. So it was good. I mean, and like it was perfectly timed with where I wanted to be, like with follow up and career stuff. So right. you know, and he was super support supportive and like That's awesome. Uh, you know, we're still friends today, and I That's see right. him around at events and have dinner with him once in a while. So yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. I have to tell you, um, you know, he's definitely one of the shining examples out there in Boston and really ele elevating, putting these guys on the map. Um, are there any other notable Boston startups that you uh, admire from a distance, let's say, or even know? I would say I know most of them. Um, <laughs> I'm, like, calling out my friends here. Uh, sure. Why so not, I, man? I think, no. well, yeah, well, I think Boundless is really interesting. Like, yeah. a few of my friends started that, and, and okay. two of the founders have actually moved on, not for any, like, negative reasons, but... Okay. Just again for like their what they wanted to do in their careers and what right. their role yeah. was. Timing, yeah, absolutely. What you know, Brian? No, no, I said timing. You know. Oh, oh, oh. I was going to say Brian is also some guy, a guy you should definitely talk to. Okay. Um, but like Ariel, Ariel Diaz runs that right now, and they're just like really interesting, kind of what they're doing with textbooks and like learning as a platform. I actually think a lot of the ed tech companies here are interesting. So, like, Better Lesson with Alex Grodd. I really just, oh, yeah. like, like his kind of mission. Oh. Um, there's okay, Better Lesson, okay. Yeah, there's obviously, like, the more, there's, like, more, like, higher flying ones. Um, HubSpot being one of them. Uh, Jimvara was doing pretty well, and they're kind of different. Um, Nanigans gets mentioned a lot, but I actually don't, I only know, like, one person there and know nothing about the company, but I just... I'm are you also, running? I'm just curious. Are you running into these guys at these co-working spaces or at, at like meetups or what? What kind of events know, are you finding I, these? I just get introduced to them because it's like, you know, I'm a, just another founder in Boston, and then like everyone's network just kind of continues to get more and more dense. Like, right, right. Um, and so I, I'm also very like into health and nutrition. So a lot of times yeah. I get like introduced to people because they're you know, a fitness guy or, uh, you know, they like to play tennis and I'm a big tennis player, obviously. Right, so, right. You know, it's just whatever kind of random connections. And like Boston is so small. Like even though the ecosystem has gotten so big, it is so small, it's sick. It's like, okay. uh, I mean, I feel like there's... When you say so small, you mean everybody just kind of bands together? Or what do you mean by small? Uh, no, I mean like just... You meet someone, and before you realize it, you have, like, five mutual friends with them, and you don't understand how you didn't know them before. Right. And then, like, later, you're like, you just, it's that kind of thing. Like, you meet okay. anyone, and you're just like, oh, oh I yeah. actually connected to you. Like, the, yeah. the networks are so interconnected now. That's cool. Um, it's interesting. That's great. What are some of the other hot sectors? You mentioned uh, education yeah. and any, anything like that, or you mentioned fitness and stuff, or anything really hot, or people are just exploring everything? So I, I think food has gotten much hotter in general, both in Boston and uh, Silicon Valley. Um, and you see a lot of investment right now happening with, like, Coastal Ventures uh, in, like, food tech. But, like, here in Boston, there's actually more just, like, actual food product startups, like, um, I actually invested in one called Kokomama Foods, which is this ready-to-eat quinoa cereal. Um, wow. But, like, the company is going to come out with, like, more products over time, like, in the... Uh, how, did, uh, how, how much did you put in and why? I can't disclose that. Come on. No, I Nobody's can't, watching. really. There is, Legally, like, one person watching this. <laughs> okay, well, real quick, can you tell uh, us about your investing? How about a range? Is it less investing? than 50 grand? Yeah, can you tell us about your investing in general? Are you doing angel investing locally, or are you uh, look at angel I I, I've only done a couple. I don't even think it's fair to call me an angel investor. It's okay. more like, so, so Kokomama Foods was the first one I did, and it was because I got to know the founder, Sarah, and her business, and she just was like, blew me away. She's like the best entrepreneur I know, and like the hardest working one, and I think her business is okay. going to be fantastic. Um, and now she's literally like in all of Whole Foods nationally. 
Like, oh, wow. within, like national distribution. Yeah. Oh, that's great. There, there it is. There's, There's distribution again. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And then I invested in Reportive um, back Reportive. in like 2010. Do you guys not use Reportive? Uh, no. Oh, yeah. Why are you using Reportive? Oh. Yeah, no. Uh, what is Reportive for those that oh should be using God. it? Oh, my God. It's like the most useful thing in Gmail ever. Oh, okay, yes. Aside yes. from follow-up, it's the most useful uh, thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm an idiot. Yes, yes, we do reportive. use Reportive. It's awesome. Yeah. 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 So... Uh, basically when they were, I, I forget, I got connected to them because of the email world and then I ended up introducing them to like, I, I don't know, like six or seven angels. Four of them were here on the East Coast in Boston. Okay. Or, or sorry, one was in New York uh, of those four. And so anyway, so like I was like, well guys, can I invest? And they were like, yeah, sure, we'd love to have you. And I was like, great. And like, you know, so. so uh, you know what? This is really great. I'm glad we're talking about this. So I, I love Reportive. I don't know why I just blanked there for a second. I love this app. And so how much, I know you don't want to tell us, but let's say you put in 30 grand or 50 grand. When are you expecting to see a return on this? Have you even talked to these guys about that? I'm just Guys, curious. do you know what happened with Reportive last year? Yeah, I forget. Did they get bought by Gmail? Is that why it's they not? They got a... bought by LinkedIn. Oh, LinkedIn. Okay. Oh, so I did not know about this. Month, Eighteen month turnaround. Wow. Yeah. LinkedIn's yeah. got a ton of money. I assume uh, was it a? So did you did you get any money out of this? Yeah, they they, they all the investors got paid in cash. Or yes, least, cash. Yeah, all right, it's time to head to the Bahamas. Let's quit <laughs> this all this stuff. That's when you went to Maui, right? Uh, That's right. Well, uh, this yeah. was this was like February 2012, so it was a while ago. Well, hopefully you made some good money there. I know you don't want to talk money, but hopefully you did. Yeah, it, it, it was a, the multiple was fair. Uh, That's all you the, want to tell us. You don't want to tell us anything more. No, guys. I mean, we're this is our first date. Come on now. <laughs> Wow, that's great. Well, congrats on that, man. Uh, it's an awesome product. Uh, so, are they still with LinkedIn? What's going on with it? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. They're still at LinkedIn. They're they're doing some interesting things. I think behind the scenes with like contacts and social. But um, my my understanding is that Reportive is, a, and this is not from them. This is just me interpreting, uh, you know, what I've seen, which is that the product hasn't changed very much, right? Aside from continuing to work in the new Gmail interfaces, but right. um, there might be a bigger plan behind the scenes. I don't know right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I can see that they obviously have a lot of great data and the contacts app that came out with from LinkedIn was probably, uh, so they, you know, LinkedIn also bought Connected HQ around the same time or a little before them. So I think somewhere they're like doing stuff together, you know, Okay. Those, I think those two acquisitions are related. And being so, Chris, I just want to point out that if these are your two angel and bets, you've already made your money back on one. I mean, that, that is a great batting uh, average, my friend. I, I Yeah, I know. Well, the, the problem is, I mean, this is like true, though. If I were to like increase the number of investments, I have a feeling the average could go down. So, That's true, too. You know, yeah. It's not like I'm some investing genius, so... No, just promote your uh, batting average as it is. I mean, yeah. I think you should go on <laughs> exactly. Angel to make sure everyone knows. Chris, the yeah. gold. I mean, I, I think I think Sarah will do really well with Coca Mama. So, um, you know, I'm optimistic on that. I mean, that was always a lot. I mean, I don't have any expectations of turnarounds when I make an investment. So, I just assume the money is gone, and then that's that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so Sarah, I mean, I think that's a really long term play, and I hope it turns into a huge win. Wow, that's this is great. This is another twist on the story, Chris. I had no idea. No, this is great. We slowly got from like uh, how you left the corporate job to starting entrepreneurship to it sounds like a few angel investments. Yeah. That you and and a, and a about. win and an early win. I mean, come on. Yeah. Right on so, your road to uh, Zuckerberg. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, he might be working for the man one day. He's prof he's prof what is it? Prophecy. He's prophesized this already. So yeah. Uh, yeah, what do you I, think, man? Do you think you'll ever, ever, if he, if he calls out to you, man, he'd be like, uh, "Mark's calling, man." Would you ever work uh, for these guys, man? I, I would totally go work. Depending on my situation, I would totally go work for someone again. I think it just has to match up with like the type of lifestyle hours I want to work. You know, like all that kind of stuff. Like I just, I, I certainly 
focus now on having the right values in terms of hours, flexibility, uh, location, just right, you know, yeah. family. You know, eventually when I have a family, that'll be a factor. But, um, but yeah, Jeff's you know, nodding and he's got a big smile on his face, and I, I'm feeling the same feeling. Like we don't want to give up our independence for nobody. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you can get a if you really like your job, you're always going to feel good, right? It's like. And if you're chasing after money and you want to go do a startup for that, it's usually a really bad reason. Like, I was definitely kind of obsessed with like my ideas at the time, and I just wanted to see them happen. And I'm still like that today. But there's also a, a little bit of like a jaded or like feeling of because I think there's so many people doing startups that like it gets kind of old to yeah, always, yeah. Uh, hear about some stupid new startup like doing a feature of something and you know so I just uh, like there's this part of me that almost doesn't like want to be in this thing really hardcore it's like I'd rather just be like on the sidelines again doing my own thing let everyone like inner network and buzz and do whatever they need to do mm -hmm. right. while I just go build something great or like work on something I like and that's it gotcha. Gotcha. Um, because I, you know, I think in, like, I think the main thing is like, people are always happiest wherever they have the best friend circle, family and friend circle. Like, if you ask anyone which is their favorite city that they've lived in, and they say some city and it doesn't sound that great, you say to them like, oh, well, did you have like a great group of friends there? And they'll say yes. Yeah. Because yeah. They no, did. that's absolutely right. That's that's absolutely yeah. true. Yeah. I didn't so, think about it like that. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, so I just, you know, and I, and I think about that now for, like, work over time. It's like, I think our lives get more and more complicated, and I certainly would love to, like, you know, be the power couple with some wife one day. But at the same time, it's like, I, I think Brad Feld is a good example of this, where he, like, super, you know, well-known guy, wealthy, like, does great stuff for entrepreneurs, is very active. But then he also has, like, his house up in the mountains of Boulder and, you know, whatever. He, like, retreats and he spends time with his wife and, like, whatever. So, and he always right. talks about that. So I just think it's, That's like, cool. really... That's a nice balance there, yeah. Yeah, I just think it's interesting to, like, think about what you really want to spend your time doing and how. Because I think a lot of people forget... I think there's a couple things. One is that people assume that, oh, if you run a VC-backed business, it's like you can just run it, like, a 9 to 5. I think A, that is false more often than not, but then B, it's also the opposite where some entrepreneurs like drive themselves crazy and like they get sick yeah. and fat and like whatever, yeah, yeah. and then you realize like you just have to work smarter, not harder. Like, wow, you're starting to sound like me. I am going a little crazy and I have put on a lot of weight recently. Uh, it's hard. Come on, Chris. Uh, it's hard to be balanced sometimes if you're like backs against the wall and you're trying to make this thing work and you... Out. Yeah. yeah, no, I, I know it is hard. Um, but you have to, I mean, these are the decisions you have to make. It's like, is it your health? Is it your wealth? Is it your, you know, business? Like, you got to pick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, can that lead into uh, what you're interested in in the health and fitness space? Uh, I worked for a startup in that space yeah, as well. And, that's right. you know, calorie you, counting you and social first, networks. Can, can you tell me first what you did in that space? Uh, it was a social network that uh, it, it basically would be a full social network connected with also a calorie counter and um, exercise tracking and such. So it'd be sort of like a run keeper. Okay. Yeah. Um, so my my interest is like I I actually like my free time is like uh, like when people talk about what they read in their free time, I generally am gravitate towards like staying up to date on health and nutrition. Uh, obviously, I stay up to date on like tech startups, but I almost spend less time doing that than I do health and nutrition. Okay. Um, and I think it's just because, like, to me, it's important to me for myself. And then I realize now it's also, of course, important to the world. And I would like my next business to be in that space. But the problem I've had is like I can't figure out a scalable technology-based kind of fitness health app you know, whatever, whatever it might manifest itself as. And I've wanted to make products too, but then I'm like, oh, I don't want to like deal with physical inventory and like the upfront cost. So that's the beauty of digital, right? It's like I can just sit here and code something yeah. and I'm done. Like I can put it out there. Well, Chris, uh, the fitness space is huge. It's a massive vertical. There's so much money in it. 
Uh, don't give up on it, man. I'm sure you're going to come up with something. Let's just say that I have another idea in the fitness space that no one is doing yet. And oh. I would like to see it happen. But I obviously have to balance that against follow-up, which is important to me in my full-time job. So, you know, we'll see. So you do have an idea. Have you sketched it out? or Have you got a little UI for it? Or have you got a little... little oh, little I mean, I, I, built, I built a prototype. But, oh. you know, but it's also a mobile thing, and I built it in a hybrid way and didn't perform very well. So HTML5 and it's not native, is that right? Yeah, because I didn't want to I did I literally didn't want to go go down the route of learning how to build a native app right now. So I just okay. didn't have time for that. But Let's uh, talk about this. Jeff and I have another talked about weekend hacking project, huh? Just like What's your, that? Uh, so this is start, starting kind of like your other projects is like a weekend hack that you're working on yourself. Yeah. Yeah, it was like I just wanted to see like what the what it would look like, how it would mm -hmm. feel and then um, because I feel like these days, if I get a good enough idea, I can find someone to kind of be a developer on it and let me just kind of manage it at a high level or uh, even like spin out a company of, in some way. So I don't know. We'll see. But um, I also know the pitfalls of like not being, you know, focused on it and, you know, putting your own energy into it. So I don't want to like make that mistake. Um, oh, so can this? Can you put up a landing page with uh, drive some keyword traffic? Get build up an email list. Uh, I mean, I should just start a blog more than anything. Uh, I mean, I do have like, I do. I did write an article on how to eat healthy at Chipotle, which was like. A very, <laughs> I love that. That's it was great. a very favorited article in Boston. Um, That's awesome. That's such a great little yeah, topic. Yeah, you got great. Chipotle on there. You want to be healthy? I'm sure a lot of people have that problem. Well, the main reason I wrote it is because Chipotle opened up in the middle of, like, the tech hub here in Boston. And so I was like, oh, this is perfect. Like, everyone's going to be like, yay, Chipotle, but they're going to eat all the wrong stuff. <laughs> yeah. Which really is, like, very – there's, like, only one big point with Chipotle, which is don't eat a burrito. Get a burrito. Bowl. Wow, that's, oh, that's the one thing I always get. <laughs> I know, but, like, that's the one – that's technically the one process thing – and, and, and I don't think you have to be gluten-free, but nonetheless, gluten doesn't do anyone any good. So, right. like, skip the burrito, and you've, like, skipped 300 calories. Because you have to remember, they put rice in the burrito. Yeah, And I'm yeah. not saying you have to eat low-carb either, but right. I'm just saying, like, rice is at least, like, kind of a real food. It's still a grain. It's still processed, but, like, it's not flour. Like, pro anyways, so burritos are just not on the list. Gotcha. Rick, go, go to the article. You'll see. It's panafit.com. It's oh. like the second. Nope. Sorry, whatfit.com? Yeah, what was the link again? Damn, I thought you would get it right. All right, just when I said it. Panafit. Panafit. Yeah, Pana, like P A N A. Okay. And so this is a blog that you started, and you've got, a, what, like an article too on this? Or what, where, yeah, what's going on? I was like just trying to. Uh, I was just trying to like get, you know, pick a brand name and just start blogging at it, but like I just can't I'm terrible about blogging. I just never find the time. So, you know, uh, this is a topic near and dear to my heart about this, you know, this guilt that we feel for not blogging enough. And um, what are you going to do about that, man? Are you going to hire like a writer to write a article or two a week or No, uh, is... I'm trying to I'm trying to develop more of like a Tumblr model in my head where it's like whatever I see that's interesting essentially gets posted there and then I just write a comment about it. It's almost like the life hacker model of like a quick summary on an article, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if people want to see more, they'll go read the original article, yeah, but hopefully I, I can a, a, like a three or four sentence summary of the main point and then that's it. And no, then, That's awesome. So you're talking about curating some of the best stuff out there. Uh, is, have you been doing this regularly, or let's see no. here, May 14th? All right, no. so it's been about a month here. Not too bad. <laughs> no, no, no. If you look at the span between the the most recent and the second, you'll see. <laughs> okay. Hey, well, listen. Content curation is an awesome way of writing content without having to write all of it. Uh, I, you know. So yeah, I've always been doing. attracted to that. I think it's a great idea if it still conveys your voice and your purpose and what you're yeah. interested in. Um, I'm really interested into that consumer reading space even, and I think it was Flipboard that they're trying to push a big feature, which is like repurposing what you've read to other people 
um, is sort of that curated thing. I think there's definitely something there. Um, yeah. But back to follow up, what do you think about blogging for follow up? Uh, uh, is it like yeah, a way to, I, to reach the masses? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I. You know, forget the uh, the salespeople. Yeah, like, exactly number, right. Yeah. Been, like number one on my list for a long time. The fact that follow up doesn't have a blog is ridiculous. Yeah, and almost kind of call you out on it. I Let's just give up know, on it right now, man. Let's not even talk about this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because because it's just gonna make him feel guilty. Uh, it's just not yeah, even. Yeah, yeah, but the, the worst part about it is there are so many little email tricks I know sure. that like it, it's mind boggling that I haven't started this blog. Well, how about this, Chris? Why don't we agree on this hangout right now, tentatively agree that you're going to put like $100 every two weeks into this problem and, and just hire some freelancers to start writing for you. All right. I literally have an email in my inbox from a guy in like the UK offering to do this. And I think the best thing would be to try to get these articles placed on other larger blogs, you know, yes. and, and not worry about your own blog, but just actually get them placed at like a read, write, hack or one of those, you know, you know, techie blogs, you know. So Yeah, I, I just think you, you're definitely going to have really awesome content, I think, to draw people in. Because the, the trouble is just people just don't know that it's there. And when uh, you give them a tip or trick that they can share with their friends, I think is a great way to draw them in. Maybe even find it off a Google search or something. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you're obviously a, a domain expert in this uh, very, you know, problemed space for people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, email overload is the biggest. I mean, inbox overload is like, that and of course following up reminders is right up there, yeah. So Yeah, no, it's interesting. And there's still like like the G T D system I never like fully read about or learned, but like people always talk about that and I'm like, oh my yeah. god, like like I don't it's just like I think people need like a lighter weight system, which follow-up fits into both that and the GTV system if you want it to. But. Well, I have to tell you, Chris, uh, not to interrupt, but Jeff and I had a wonderful hour-long interview with this woman from uh, Eastern Europe, Latvia? Was it Latvia, Jeff? Yeah, Julia. It was Latvia, yeah. And she places articles for this big startup uh, incubator out there, and they get a lot of their traffic to all their products, their startup products, from these articles that she places. And it's brilliant, man. It is great. So okay. I would suggest at least watch and then make you make your own conclusions. You know, I don't want to be touting our horn too much, but uh, it's awesome. Uh, that was a great interview. Yeah, some other tips that I could imagine are like, you know, going to Quora and finding people that are like actively searching for uh, solutions to this sort of problem. I'm sure that you guys would be a, a you know, a, a shoe in. Hopefully your, your members are already giving those answers out there. Yeah, I, that's exactly what I was about to say is there's like, um, there's a there's definitely quite a few members who like throughout the web whenever there's like an email tools article and also on Quora, they they put it in right there. They they fill it in for me. Oh, that's great to have a community that'll do that for you. Yes, yeah, that's a awesome. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, people helping people. So you know, Chris, uh, this is gonna go way off tangent, but uh, before I got on the show and I've been talking to Jeff internally about this, I want to try to get competitors all to come on a hangout together. What do you think of that idea? Like maybe three or four of your competitors, so-called competitors. I think you need a good, like, topical reason to get them interested in doing it. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't call it just a competitors getting on board. I'd say uh, your industry, um, you know, leaders or uh, you, you share the same share the same industry of email, maybe. Uh, so maybe a couple. Uh, you know, we're not trying to look at getting you know super fierce. Uh, I, I actually like. That, I, oh, wait, 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 wait! I got really confused for a sec. You mean like me and my like industry cohorts? Yes, yeah, exactly. Oh, I thought you meant you guys and your like competitors or industry cohorts. Now I'm yeah. like, well, you should have a topic for that. <laughs> yeah, we're, no, we were thinking of a panel with like the topic being you know email, uh, maybe just email tools. This you know the state of the industry. Where yeah, uh, yeah. you know again we have a hard time leading the discussion, but I think it you know kind of uh, would lead itself you know with the people that uh, are interested in it so much. Yeah, I think these things are a good idea. The only thing I worry about with panels like that is, you know, is like letting people, uh, people, people sometimes get afraid of giving away insights or like product dev yeah. stuff or any of that because they're like, right. I don't want my competitor to know yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. So it's kind of like you have to be really good at moderating so that mm. in a way it's like people are answering questions that have useful answers um, or useful perspectives, but... Uh, it's not like turning into 
well, you know, we we did this, and this worked yeah. perfectly for us, and then everyone's <laughs> yeah, yeah. like, oh, great, I'm going to go do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, 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 I understand. Self-promotion is, is a part of it, but the other part of it is, is really trying to extract some really uh, non-promotive value out of them. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, you know, yeah, one thought yeah. I had... But the One thought I had, is, though, Chris, really, really briefly, was that me, Jeff had sent me a link to this guy that's doing a crowdsourcing platform, okay. and, he's, and he started this, and uh, he got all of his competitors, including somebody we'd interviewed from Sweden. Uh, what was the name of those guys? Flatter. Uh, it, yeah. Flatter, yeah. We talked to Linus. Oh, yeah. yeah Linus. So they had Flatter, the Linus, and had a couple of his other competitors on, and it was really, uh, when I was watching this, the first thought I had was, like, this is awesome. Like, all the competitors... Even though they're competing with each other, they all realize they're all trying to do the same thing or trying to help the same people. They're all motivated in sometimes different ways, but sometimes similar. And it was just, I don't know, I just thought it was really cool. I, I never saw it, I never seen anything like that before. And uh, It was sort of the power of the Google Hangout almost, too, that brought them together. Uh, you know, it's a little less stressful than, uh, you know, sitting up on a stage or something. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the, like, the hangout, you know, and like video conferences and all this. I think it's been great. But cool. uh, no, I think you guys should do something. I think you should try something. I think the easiest thing to try is getting a bunch of startup, different startup people talking about a more generalized topic versus, um, I mean, so for example, there was that conference Inbox Love in uh, San Francisco, okay. um, which obviously is all about email and the inbox and blah, blah, blah. But right. I don't, I don't, they had a couple panels, but I don't know how those went. I wasn't there. Um, so I don't know. You, hey, right, this is the classic startup thing. You just got to try it and yeah. see what happens. Uh, yeah. yeah, see what sticks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was just curious if you'd be interested in coming on with Matthew. Maybe we can get a couple of the other competitors on and, and you know oh, see what happens oh, no, I don't think you know the trouble you're causing <laughs> <laughs> we're looking forward to I, I, you yeah. know that was and I'm glad you brought up the trouble I, the, the first thought I, was, I, I had was like alright fight you know <laughs> and then the second thought I had was everybody was not fighting and they're being sort of respectful for each other and I thought that was really cool and I liked that the tension between like <laughs> They are competitors, but they're being respectful, and that was awesome. You know, like Here, here's the problem. The problem is like, I think in the email, in like our specific email space, I think it's a little too small, and we all know each other that it may not be like the right space to do it. I think you need like a slightly bigger space, uh, you know, because uh, like I know I know Matt decently well. Okay, I know. All the other people. I mean, I haven't. I've met most of the other people. I can't say I'm like friends with them or like hang out with them. But right, right. Um, you know, it's just like there, there's been a lot of time for us to all like do our thing, use our right. products, build our products, etc. Sure. Do you ever feel like, oh man, these guys started when I started. They're doing so much better. Do you ever get any of those feelings, or oh, they tried this new cool feature. I got to incorporate it. Do you ever get it that competitive? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. I mean, like, see something sometimes, I'm like, shit. I'm like, I should have done that already. Or like, oh, I thought of that a year ago. Why didn't I do that? But then right. that's true of, like, the startup idea. I'm like, oh, I thought of that a year ago. And right. then it's on TechCrunch. And it's like, yeah. and then it turned into, like, something show. I read something on TechCrunch. I'm like, oh, I thought of that a week ago. Yeah. And then I see something on TechCrunch. I'm like, oh, I thought of that yesterday. <laughs> right. right. Well, and I'm just that's... like, this is just dumb. It's like, uh, I just can't even, like, read this stuff anymore. Because... <laughs> You know, if you're not going to build it and act on it, and I get yeah. crap from my friends about this all the time with my own ideas, they're like, dude, just do it. Like, just yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Make it happen. All right, going back to this, this stealth mobile app that you've made, are you, uh, so the name of it is Pana, Panafit? Is that the name of this app? Wait, what? The, the blog, your Panafit blog? Is, is that the name oh, of the no, app? No, no, that was, that was just like a generic fitness blog. Name. Oh, I thought maybe that was the name of your app and you didn't well, want to lose no. and all that stuff. Okay. I assumed you guys were smarter than that. I'm not going <laughs> to... All right, all right. So yeah. are you going to do anything with this thing or what's ha what's what's your... We are going to leave that for a future interview. All right, yeah. all right. So fair enough. Follow up with because by the way, my laptop has magically gone from 99% to like 9%. Gotcha. <laughs> it, it, we're, we're getting closer to like an hour and 45 minutes now. Yeah, wow. we've definitely gone long. Uh, we, we appreciate your time. I hope you had uh, as good of a time as we did. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. This is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's just uh, let's just uh, 
back, you know, let's just uh, continue this at a later date or offline. Uh, yeah. Jeff, we can, uh, do you have anything you'd like to add here? Or? Uh, no, I think this has been great. It was a, a surprise as always to, uh, you know, see what we were going to talk about, but I sure learned a lot. Yeah. yeah I'm glad. And, and, you know, before we leave, I always ask everybody, like, what, where do you see the future of this product? And, you know, if you can, you know, say it within the next 20, 30 minutes, that'd be great. You mean seconds? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, like 9 like, of your battery. follow-ups is going to continue to get easier to use, more elegant to interact with, and smarter behind the scenes. Like, it's that simple. That's, yeah, okay. That's a lot. That's saying a lot. Is there one big feature you're thinking of launching next that you want to tell us about? Uh, you'll see it soon. Okay. Uh, see it soon. Fair so enough. We'll fair enough. Leave it at that. The same way you sent out your newsletter on July 4th, I still need to send out my second <laughs> newsletter ever. Right, right, right. Absolutely. I can. If I, and I'm just going to say this on air. Uh, please, please do this content marketing thing, man. Just throw a little bit of money at it. Yeah. Uh, I think. I know. Really... I'm so sad that I worked at HubSpot and this is the, you know, that yeah. I haven't done that. Yeah, they're all about inbound, so yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, well, thanks again for being on our show, Chris. It's been a pleasure, man. Please uh, uh, tell you. You guys have a job, too. All right, what's that? Uh, well, yeah, what's up? Use follow-up after we hang up. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Go register on the site and use it today. Fair enough, yeah. fair and enough. Everyone right. listening and watching will do that as well. Yeah, okay. Follow-up.cc. Absolutely, yeah, follow-up.cc, yeah. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks again for coming on, man. I, I, it's been I, it's been awesome. Honestly, it doesn't feel like two hours to me. No, it didn't. Thank you. This was really fun. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's been really great. All right. Well, uh, catch us again uh, on 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, everybody, Google, on Google Hangouts uh, Live. All right. See, See you guys. Bye. Bye.